ladies and gentlemen. So thank you very much for sticking around. As I said, we were just going to be a couple of minutes. And now I'm very pleased to get our first CEO panel of the Global Market Day or the Global Markets Theatre underway. And today we also must thank our sponsors, BP, for their generous sponsorship of today. And today is the World Bank Global Offshore Wind Day. So thank you also to the World Bank. We look forward very much to that as well. So this CEO panel is on offshore wind. So for the past decade, offshore wind has grown from, a northern, from its northern European roots to become a crucial pillar of the energy transitions for countries across the globe. 2021 was a record year for offshore wind, with 21 gigawatts installed. The rate of build-out needs to be double that year on year if we're going to avoid our, the climate catastrophe. And today we have a, a panel ranging of CEOs and industry leaders uh, from across the offshore wind industry. But before we listen to those guys and get into that, I'd like to hand back to the uh, Senior Vice President again from uh, BP, from Offshore Wind, Matthias Balsenwey, for to do his uh, opening remarks. Matthias, welcome to the stage yet again. Please give him a hand. Yeah, thanks for sticking around and uh, listen to me again. Uh, this time I spend a bit more time. Um, hello, everyone. Um, let me just say again how great it is to be here. Um, I recently joined BP only. Uh, that meant quite, a uh, quite some time working in London. Now I'm traveling a lot. Um, it's good to be back in Germany, here in Hamburg. As I said, I lived here for a long time. When I think about the city, I remember the great people, a uh, sense of humor, ships coming in and out, great office. Um, of course, when our industry thinks about Hamburg, um, it thinks of a center of gravity for offshore wind. Uh, we're in the right place, for sure, where some of its suppliers are turbine producers, uh, consultants, project developers, etc., etc. When we talked about um, Hamburg in London, um, my UK colleagues, when they think of Hamburg, they think of something else. They think, um, what do you think they think about? Any guess? They think about the Beatles. Uh, so uh, not, not the Sergeant Pepper, Yoko Ono once with the beard, uh, but uh, no, the, the fresh-faced, mop-haired Beatles uh, in their formative years. Uh, and um, they think of the place where John and Paul and George met Ringo Starr, and they think of where the band created its first single. Um, they think of John Lennon, who once said the Beatles may have been born in Liverpool, but we grew up in Hamburg. And uh, he knew the importance of the city and the, the city uh, had on their success. Um, and this got us then thinking about offshore wind. Um, so we thought in some ways offshore wind is the Beatles of energy. So uh, hear me out. Um, the <laughs> so offshore wind is pioneering change, right? Uh, it's shaking up its industry now, the renewable industry. And after these formative years in Europe and also in the city, by the way, um, offshore wind is now making its way in the world. Um, today, countries around the world are growing capacity at pace. In fact, last year was a record for the industry. Um, time, I think, more than 20 gigawatt. There was a bit of um, uh, China in there, but uh, more than 20 gigawatt new offshore wind capacity was connected to grid worldwide. And uh, by the end of the year, I think Asia will also through that be the likely, more likely be the most uh, world's largest offshore wind market. But while we should celebrate this global growth, and that's also back to what uh, Ben said before, um, together, together we need to do more now. Um, we need to, uh, first of all, we need to double the rate of offshore wind build out. That's a challenge per se. Um, um, we need to do that to have any hope that we uh, meet the goals to set, set out in the Paris uh, Climate uh, Agreement. The good news is it can be achieved. I think so, um, but um, as, as the Beatles, basically, it needs a great manager or management to fulfill their potential. So um, offshore wind needs its own helping hands, um, and that's where we all come in. We can turn offshore wind's formative years into formidable ones, um, and in turn, get it in track to help the world meet its climate uh, uh, targets. I want to outline this through four ways we can do that, our own FAB4, so to say, um, four areas around planning, policy, people, and perseverance. Let's begin with plans. Um, the good news is many are already in place. Um, the world somehow in concert now to on the need, somehow in concert on the need to scale up renewables. 
uh, and the energy crisis now caused in large part by Russia has refocused efforts. We've, we've seen that in the U.S. Uh, with the U.S. Um, and the Inflation Reduction Act, um, really uh, good to have that now, seeking to create important incentives for clean energy and equity center environmental investments. We've seen it in Europe, just basically with increased public support. Um, at least that's what I read and saw in, in the news. Uh, I think it's still the case. Um, paving the way for further investment in infrastructure uh, needed to support the energy transition. In, here in Germany, for example, this summer also with the reforms of the Renewables Energy Act. But um, when I say that, you also know uh, we need uh, more to do on that, more on the framework, more on the planning. It pledges that wind and solar power will make up 80% of electricity production by 2030, up from 42 today. And it's a wow to expand Germany's offshore wind energy to 30 gigawatt by 2030 and up to 70 by 2035. But it needs a lot of action um, to get there. Businesses are taking actions, I would say, uh, for BP's part. Uh, now time to say a few words about us as well. Um, we are very serious now about offshore wind. In fact, we aim to be a leader in the field. Um, that's why I also wanted to join the company. Uh, I see the potential for what we can achieve. And um, in 2020, we BP entered the world's fastest growing offshore wind market in the US. Last year, we entered Europe's largest market, the pioneer market, also the UK. And this year, we strengthened our position in the UK further while seeking new opportunities in other markets. It means that in just two years, we've gone from a pipeline of zero to an expected generation capacity of more than 10 gigawatt, working with our partners. Uh, by 2030, our ambition is to deliver 50 gigawatt of renewable energy. Um, center stage to this effort will be wind energy projects. And it's true, we don't have a big history in offshore wind yet. But um, we do have, of course, a big um, experience. Uh, things play in our favor, decades of experience executing large civil engineering projects safely, on time, on budget. We know how to work in challenging offshore environments, how to put together complex supply chains, uh, work closely with local partners and governments, not just in a handful of locations, but all around the world, day in, day out, 360 days a year. So the planning is important, and uh, I agree, targets, uh, we have a lot of targets, but it's also good to have them. The more and the clearer they are, and also increasing the targets now, that, that helps a lot because it gives certainty to invest. So it's sometimes only a signal, but, it, but it's helpful. Planning is important, but getting projects off the ground takes time. Too long in many instances, and that's why I brought policy as the second one. Uh, policy can help here. Um, the world doesn't have the luxury of waiting years for offshore wind projects to start producing energy. So we need, first of all, governments get to behind it, behind wind. Uh, they, can, they have to create efficient permitting processes in, in many markets still, effective tender designs, simplify grid build out and legislation, and reduce bureaucracy for the licensing, for the construction of renewable plants and grids. Here we see, again, back to Germany as we are here, German government has promised to just do that, um, but uh, with a plan to decentralize and centralize tenders. So um, we hope that this will ease the burden also on the government and the authorities to manage the consenting for all the sites. And we wait with interest to see how effective this new format is. Um, maybe one thing to mention here in policy, um, or maybe, I don't know whether it fits in here, but current cost development, I just want to mention it, especially the high inflation, a big challenge, but in general the industry uh, and in the world um, has to um, fight against that and fight with that. We had a time when margins get squeezed. I would argue there is some need to think jointly about how to invest or how to increase supply chain capacity um, I think the greater offshore wind build-out is only possible if returns are also achievable across the supply chain. Um, indexation could be one way on the tariffs where we have them. Um, now just looking at the inflation. Um, all this um, is relevant and important. Planning is important, so is policy. Third point, people. Um, that's vital. My third point in BP, we're all about brilliant people, but we're also about uh, teams working together. Uh, it will take a team effort, effort to further accelerate growth of offshore wind. And um, like the Beatles uh, at BP, we need a little help from our friends here and there, um, great people in wind. 
Uh, we work with, uh, for example, EMBW in the UK, one of our strong partners there. In Germany, we work with ThyssenKrupp Steel, Daimler, looking to decarbonize heavy industry and mobility here in Germany, among others. And it's not just companies. We also enjoy great relations with countries. I can tell you firsthand the great affection BP has for its business and history in Germany, where we operate Europe's second largest refinery, our Lingen refinery, where we hope to soon produce green hydrogen. Uh, in Germany, we're also the market leader in energy lubricants through our Castrol Heritage brand. Uh, in Germany, we have a leading network of petrol stations, which is becoming a growing network of EV ultra-fast charging uh, stations. And we have 4,000 employees in Germany. And they all call it home, and we will ho have more employees based here soon. In this very city, I'm, I'm happy to announce that we plan to open the dedicated offshore wind office right here in Hamburg. Of course, uh, we are very excited by this and we will have more to say soon. It's all part of our commitment to offshore wind, to Germany and this great city. Um, I think we have to truly do more um, when we now look at Germany, at the world. Um, why am I mentioning this? I, I truly think we, 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 we need to integrate these businesses, and that's why I gave you a little bit of insight what BP is doing here in Germany as an example. Um, our, we offer our customers a range of energy solutions rather than just one. Uh, much like the Beatles, uh, individually they were great, but they could do so much more together. The same is true with energy, especially when you use offshore wind as a catalyst. Let me give you two examples. Um, the, one, the first one is our successful bid with EMBW in Scotland earlier this year, where we're developing a huge offshore wind project off the coast of Scotland. But uh, that's just one part of the story. Connected to this, we plan to expand electrical vehicle charging in the country, produce green hydrogen too, creating many jobs in the process. We plan to do similar in the Netherlands. The WP has bid for two offshore wind permits. Um, uh, with a focus on creating an integrated energy system. And what could that look like? It would mean taking the electrons from its wind offshore, using it to produce green hydrogen, taking that hydrogen, using it for sustainable aviation fuels and for heavy duty transport. We also would like to take this wind to wheel concept directly to Dutch motorists, using the electricity generated offshore to power our EV charging hubs. This type of projects is what we mean when we talk about BP transitioning to becoming an integrated energy company. And I think it's one of the uh, solutions also in the future to, to deal with um, the challenges of the sector. Um, more offshore wind, combining offshore wind with other low carbon energy, create more solutions. It's very much needed. And that brings me to the last point, perseverance. Throughout history, energy transitions, and we are in the middle of it, now challenged by a lot of sight effects, unfortunately, but energy intrusions have taken time, whether it's wood to coal or coal to oil, oil to gas, and the same is true as we seek to further scale up renewables. There's no straight line to success, but together we have the potential to grow offshore wind and uh, expand it uh, in a way that the world um, needs, uh, gets what it needs. We need the right plans in place, a blueprint, where we can get there, we need the right policies, and we need the right people to come together in partnerships and alliances to get the best out of offshore wind. So back to John Lennon's quote about the Fab Four growing up here, learned the expertise, went on become a global success. Let's take inspiration from that story, from history, and expand offshore wind, the beetles of energy, to even greater heights. Thanks for listening. Well done, Matthias, and thank you for bringing some rock star back into the uh, offshore wind world. Very interesting. Uh, to set the scene for the CEO panel that we're going to have, I'd like to introduce to the stage Mr. Oliver Metcalf, the head of wind research at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Please make Oliver welcome. Thanks, Ollie. How about now? Yeah, better? Perfect. Hey everyone, great, great to be here. Great to be back in Hamburg and, uh, and nice to see all your lovely faces and get to do my best Britney Spears impression again, which is nice. Um, so today uh, I wanted to speak a bit about driving, driving growth in offshore wind. Um, where can I find the, the clicker? Uh, who's stolen it?
All right, nobody leave. We're looking for the clicker. We, we, we're going around one by one. Who has the clicker? Who has the clicker? Clicker, clicker. Anyone? There'll be, there'll be a lot of clicks. I prefer not to have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, just click. Uh, there we go. Um, <laughs> this is going to get quite messy. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to flip things around a little bit and first talk about the, the long-term opportunity uh, before maybe touching on, on one of the barriers we see for the offshore wind sector today, particularly around inflation in the current inflationary environment. Um, next slide, please. But ju just a quick word about, about BNF first. So my name's Oliver Metcalf. I'm the head of wind research at Bloomberg NEF. Um, we're a research provider, uh, but uh, we're actually one team uh, in, in a much larger company with, with, with a much greater scope. And it's expertise on all these other sectors you can see behind me uh, that allows us to say smarter things about the wind, the wind industry. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and next slide, please. <laughs> and then the next one. I told you it'd get messy. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So long-term opportunities. So on, on the chart here, you can see uh, our, uh, our forecast of offshore wind installations, uh, bottom fixed and floating, uh, last year and out, out until 2024. You can see that it was a really big year for offshore wind last year. The sector hit almost 17 gigawatts of installations, but very weighted towards China as developers were racing to take advantage of an expiring feed-in tariff. So this year, installations are going to drop off a little bit as, as China um, is, is reduced installations, but other markets like the UK and Taiwan are going to come and fill in that gap a little bit. The following two years, we see a bit of a bump up to around 16 gigawatts plus again. And then we hit this period of rapid growth in the second half of the decade. Now, what I love about this chart is just how colorful it gets in the second half of the decade. And each of those new colors represents a new offshore wind market installing capacity at scale. So chief among these is the US, which is going from having just seven operating turbines installed in the water today to being the third largest market globally by 2027 and installing 50 gigawatts by 2035. But it's not just the US. There are new markets that are emerging in Europe, like Poland. Uh, also new markets in APAC, like, uh, like Vietnam, South Korea, and Japan. And then we expect to see a bit of a plateau in the early 2030s. But that's a plateau at around three times, uh, or even more than three times, the installations we're expected to see uh, this year. And what gives us the confidence there's going to be this demand that's going to be driving installations in the second half of the decade? Well, we've collected information around uh, auctions and tenders that are happening over the next year and a half or so. And countries are going to offer over 30 gigawatts of offtake contracts over that time period. So that gives us a little bit more certainty that the demand is there. But we're also seeing countries look even longer term and start to identify offshore wind as a key technology that's going to help them meet their net zero commitments. So on the chart here, you can see our uh, EU installation forecast out to 2035 and the applied in implied installations that will be required over the remaining 15 years in order to hit that 300 gigawatts by 2050 target. And you can see that already three of the biggest markets uh, make up almost, almost all of that 300 gigawatts of commitment. So we're beginning to see country-level commitments in just a few markets almost hit that total 300 gigawatt uh, goal. If, if you're wondering what the step down is, it's according to our forecast, the Netherlands interim target that they announced uh, just over a week ago is actually more, more ambitious than their longer-term 2050 target. So that's the long-term opportunity, the, 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 the prize that awaits companies as we move into the second half of the decade. But we're also seeing some short-term challenges in terms of inflationary pre uh, pressures. So I think to understand what's going on today, it's important to understand uh, what's happened historically. So on, uh, at BNF, we collect information around uh, new build capex for projects across time. We've been doing it for a long time. Each of these dots represents an offshore wind farm securing finance. On the y-axis, you can see the capex in million dollars per megawatt. And on the x-axis, you can see uh, the, the project's uh, year of financial close. 
So actually, you'll notice that back in early 2000, uh, we were actually seeing very cheap offshore wind projects. But these were demonstrators. They're in very shallow waters. They're very close to shore, not having to build that expensive export cable. Now, as European projects moved further from shore, but also crucially, there was a, a boom in the economy in China, and many input costs also rose, we started to actually see the cost of off offshore wind increase. There are some exceptions. We still saw some uh, projects in, in, in close uh, in, in uh, projects close to shore and in deeper waters, like in China, in Vietnam, uh, some more recently in, in, in Denmark. But slowly we started to see competitive pressure from auctions and more powerful turbines start to bring price pressure and bring down the, the cost of offshore wind. There are some exceptions. Some early uh, demonstrators in new markets came out significantly more expensive. Floating projects in the UK and France, those demos were also uh, significant, around two to three times CapEx premium to a, a bottom fixed project. And those first commercial scale projects in markets like Taiwan and France that had some local content requirements, and more recently in the US and South Korea, also came in at a CapEx premium. But I've highlighted, I'll try to, I've highlighted two projects that recently secured finance in the UK here, uh, Sophia and Doggerbank C that have got, begun to get back to that $3 million per megawatt mark that we saw in the early 2000s. But the difference here is that these are industrial scale projects, part of multi-gigawatt uh, project portfolios in the same regions, 200 kilometers from shore, and they're paying for that export cable. So the, the, the way they're doing it is, is the scale that the industry has hit, and they're using 14 megawatt turbines on those projects. But we're finding out, as we saw in the past, prices don't always go down. So on the chart here, you can see uh, some important metals prices for, for the input costs for, for uh, offshore wind projects, uh, rebased to the prices at January 2019. And you can see that as countries bounce back from pandemic-induced lockdowns, we begin, we begin to see prices spike significantly. And it's not just metals. We saw the same thing for epoxide resins, uh, an important material for blades. Uh, and for, uh, for uh, logistics costs. So I've highlighted here some, some key shipping routes for the, for the wind industry. And it's hitting the industry hard. So on the chart here, you can see product margins, that's turbine margins, for some of the, the, the major listed wind turbine makers. Uh, and as these companies have had to deliver on contracts that they signed a long time ago for lower prices, then we've seen margins slip significantly. And if you can look at the margins that were reported in the first quarter of 2022, they've slipped severely into the, into the negative territory. And so at the moment, the, uh, the supply chain looks in a, in a fairly un, unhealthy, unhealthy situation. But we're also seeing these effects uh, move up the value chain and, and towards developers as well. So on the chart here, you can see our uh, global LTOE analysis for a range of renewable energy technologies, uh, comparing the first half of 2021 to the first half of 2022. And you can see almost across the board, we've seen increases in LCOE. And actually, if you remove the impact of China on offshore wind, which was such a, a, a big proportion of the market, then we also see a significant increase in, in offshore wind uh, LCOEs as well. So some of these companies are having to deliver on fixed price offtake contracts. They, uh, they agreed in the past in an inflationary environment. So we're seeing that those inflationary impacts move up the value chain. So it's been short and sweet, but I wanted to finish on a bit, bit of a more positive note. So we have been here before, and it's important to remember that we've seen inflation before. We're in a very, very difficult environment at, at the moment, but this doesn't mean that those longer-term trends, the longer-term development of the offshore wind industry has finished. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to the panel digging into some of these, uh, some of these topics and, and more. And uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ali, and uh, well done for riding through the clicker drama, which we'll all remember. Um, I saw a lot of mobile phones taking photos of all of these uh, slides, and that's great, and uh, that's very welcome to do this. However, I also need to mention that we are streaming all of these uh, programs or all of these sessions on live, uh, online, and so you'll be able to go and relive these sessions if you want to uh, retrack over, retrace some of the gold that Oliver presented. I would like to now 
bring to the stage the Head of Offshore Wind from the Global Wind Energy Council, Rebecca Williams. Rebecca, welcome to the stage and for introducing your panel. Please give Rebecca a hand. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Can you all hear me? Can I get a shout out if you can hear me? Yeah, great. Okay, now we're on to the good stuff, although I really enjoyed those presentations, particularly Matthias, as a big fan of both the Beatles and the offshore wind industry, it's nice to see my passions come together in that way, so thanks for that. Um, so today's theme is all around implementation. We've got to get to 380 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 and 2,000 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. But it's also, also about learning from each other. And we've got a large World Bank Group delegation, as I'm sure you all know, here in the room. So who better to learn from than our industry experts and leaders who are going to join me in this panel. Uh, and I'll invite them to the stage now, one by one. So Matthias, welcome back. If, if you can come up to the stage, hopefully you've got a microphone. So this is Matthias Bausenwein, uh, Senior Vice President at BP, as you know. Yes, please, yes. Then if I can invite Katrin Jung uh, from Vattenfall. Uh, Katrin is Head of Business Unit Offshore Wind at Vattenfall. If you want to go there, Katrin. Thank you. Uh, Mary Quaney, who is Group Chief Executive at Mainstream Renewable Power. Up oh, you go there, Mary. And I'm just gradually moving to the side here. Then we have Martin Gerhardt, who is Senior Vice President Offshore Platform and Portfolio Management at Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. And then last but not least, we have Jonathan Cole, who's CEO at Corio Generation. Please give them all a warm welcome to the stage. Fantastic. So I know that many of you in the audience will want to kind of get into the nitty gritty about exactly how do we do this? How do we grow offshore wind around the world and how are we going to implement this? So maybe Matthias, I'll, I'll start with you. Now BP is focused on many emerging markets, I think it's fair to say. Um, and we will need to deploy offshore wind at a very rapid pace. But actually, you know, our history in Europe has shown that offshore wind projects do take time to develop. They, they have considerable lead times. So how can we accelerate the rollout of offshore wind in these emerging markets and make sure it doesn't take another nine, 10 years to develop an offshore wind project in those emerging markets? Yeah, um, thanks. Um, I think we, um, we, you mentioned already we need to learn from each other and we need to leverage learnings from the other markets. I mean, these new markets or emerging markets don't have to repeat the whole uh, story again, right? We, there's a lot of learnings. We said that always when, when I was in Asia, we always said in Europe um, they have gone through all this. Uh, you don't have to repeat this again. But of course, that's not how it goes in practice. I think if we can harvest a bit of the learnings, uh, that would be really good. At the same time, we need to take into account that every jurisdiction is a bit different. We mm. see um, for, for sure a very strong tendency to localize in, uh, in, in certain markets, and that's also fair enough. When people want to build up uh, re the renewable industry, they also want to see um, jobs, a supply chain. But I think it's important, and back to the learning and collaboration point, that they uh, look what else is in the region, where to focus, how to collaborate, and where to set, where to put certain emphasis. Mm, mm. Thank you. Thank you for those points. And um, maybe if I'll just come over now to, um, to Mary. I mean, Mary, just uh, building on that theme. So in many of the markets that we're, that we're looking at in the offshore wind industry, many of the markets that I know mainstream is, is looking at, there's going to have to be considerable um, development in terms of the associated infrastructure. And I'm just wondering, what's your take on this acceleration point? Do you think that these markets have the right infrastructure in terms of grids, in terms of ports? And how can we get that associated infrastructure into the right place? Yeah, I think, um, you know, generally speaking, there are very few countries that have um, started to develop offshore wind at scale with the full suite of infrastructure in place. So that's certainly, you know, not unique to, to the emerging countries for, for offshore wind. You know, we've seen here in Europe and, you know, particularly in the UK, if we think back to, to round one when, you know, that infrastructure simply wasn't there. Um, but I think that, you know, most countries have a very solid starting point in terms of, you know, an infrastructure base that's 
already in existence, perhaps for um, for shipping, for for, for fishing, um, for the oil and gas sector. You know that can be repurposed, and um, you know one of the one of the the key themes I think. Um, again, you know, not 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 a unique one. Even if I think of our home country in Ireland, just a study that came out last week um, concluded that there's only one port across the the island that's suitable for 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 offshore wind, and therefore there's a, an enormous amount of focus required in terms of port infrastructure. So that's the case across many many different um, different types of markets. And I think that what we have seen then, you know, work well here in European waters is that multi-port yeah. strategy. You know, considering the deployment of a very large scale multi-gigawatt portfolio of of offshore arrays, perhaps multi-jurisdictional. And I think that's um, a, an area that can can provide you know tremendous benefits as as an industry establishes itself. Similarly, with regard to to grid, um, I, I, I can't really think of of any country that doesn't have grid challenges at the moment. You know, it's it's a it's a constant theme. You know, you saw the 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 example um, earlier from California with regard to amber alerts. Also in Ireland, we've had amber alerts. You know, there's there's a very significant amount of pressure on grid transmission across. Europe and across, you know, of course, the, the emerging countries for for offshore wind, and but I think what's what's interesting is the the that in itself then can bring an opportunity for some countries to to leapfrog towards mm. um, the 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 rapid deployment of of offshore wind. You know, we're seeing some examples where grid capacity had been allocated for planned new coal installations that are not now proceeding as governments. Uh, revisit their 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 uh, power plans and their decarbonisation towards net zero, and therefore, you know, capacity well suitable for for offshore wind. And again, you know, taking some of the the learnings that have been made here in in European waters, you know, a focus on on grid, not just on a national perspective, but in terms of an international, more interconnected grid infrastructure. And um, again, you know, there, there are many areas that we can learn from what has been done to date and look at what is required to achieve the very rapid upscaling that is necessary. Mm. Mm. Thanks for that, Mary. And maybe Katrin, just coming to you, because I think many of the, the countries who are here um, and the World Bank delegation are thinking about leasing and seabed allocation and how they can get that right in a way that's that balances the, the needs of different stakeholders in the ocean, but also that enables offshore wind to be deployed quickly. So I'm really interested in your, in your take on this. Uh, and in particular, you know, how, how do you see that balance between different stakeholders playing out? And um, are there any kind of learnings and, and best practices that you would give to the audience here around that process? Yeah, of course, in, in the European waters, where there's more and more capacity to be built, there's also a higher um, discussion or more discussion about um, conflict of interests. And then, of course, um, the question around how do you work together to safeguard nature in the best way possible becomes more and more urgent. And I think there have been a lot of learnings. Um, I also even think that within Europe we can still learn between the different countries because different solutions are being used in different countries as well, different best practices. If I look, for example, at our homeland, Sweden, um, we can see that um, what we call uh, Natura 2000 areas can actually be used um, for offshore wind, of course then with obligations and with compensation me measures. But um, yeah, you need to weigh the, um, yeah, the benefits against the, um, uh, yeah, the interests, the different interests, and then solutions can be found. Mm. So of course, solutions always lie into seeing, um, really measuring which kind of birds would be around, how can you best um, deal with that. I think the most, um, yeah, the easiest solution is usually say if you have um, birds passing through an area, you just close down the wind park for a couple of months, which is obviously not <laughs> the most efficient way. So I think we have become a lot more clever now in how we measure and how we can then curtail the wind parks when it's really necessary at those hours. Um, what we also can see actually, um, if you go out offshore, you see it quite well, is that um, birds actually use the offshore wind parks out there, the platforms, to, um, yeah, to, to take a break on the way. So they're actually um, also good spots for birds to just um, yeah, yeah, make it to the coast, just as simple as that. So 
we are, we are of course, um, doing more and more research and measurements and also finding out that um, even if we, um, if, if birds, especially birds, but then also other mammals um, leave the area for construction, they actually come back afterwards. And um, yeah, the, the population is not decreased, mm. but either is being then pushed to another area or is actually plainly coming back. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, research going into that field. Mm. Thanks for that, Katrin. I think that's really kind of solid practical experience for, for many of the countries in the audience who are dealing with these challenges. I want to move on now to talk about supply chain, <laughs> a big focus for, for many of the people in the audience and indeed for the conference as a whole. And maybe I'll come to you, Martin, first, and then I'll, I'll come to Jonathan for his take on this too. Um, but we've, we've heard a lot, I think, about the need to scale up, the need for implementation, and I know that many people in the audience are also trying to consider how they'll build a domestic supply chain in their own country. So the, there's some uh, interesting points, I think, uh, that will, will come out in the discussion here. But what I want to ask you is, um, is the kind of global supply chain ready at the moment to be able to meet this huge demand that we're going to see from other countries? And also perhaps touching on whether you believe that the market at the moment is structured in the right way to achieve that. So double prong question, are we ready? And do we have the right structures in place? So let, let me start with the first thing. I think there's a clear yes if it goes to technology, if it goes to also the experience or competence, um, and also the pioneering spirit. I think that it took this industry, like the Beatles, to come from a niche <laughs> and now to the main stage, right? Um, but if you look at the picture that you saw on the financials, this is a clear no. If you see the European wind turbine manufacturers, um, we are really uh, in, in deep red um, numbers. Um, and I think um, we have partly broken supply chains, but we have, of course, enormous challenges with these um, raw material increases. Mm. Just to give you one example, also from the chart, um, steel increased by 100%, partly even higher, and uh, wind turbine has made 60 to 70% out of steel, right? And we have long-term contracts, so this now fully hits um, our books. Um, and of course, this ca cannot continue like that. And it makes it very difficult in this environment to invest. Coming to the structure, I think we have seen also an unhealthy structure in the market. We have a very limited pipeline of projects. We have new entrants from the oil and gas rushing into that. I think we have seen bits that are, yeah, I would say, maybe even crazy. Uh, if you look at the, the CBIT leases and, and the prices. And of course, a lot of this pressure comes then down to us as OEMs. Um, and I think that's not healthy. We need to rebalance that. And the third point I think I would like to make, it's also about energy independence. Yeah? I think we need that European OEMs, yeah? and we need to get go keep them going forward. Yeah? Um, if you look at the solar industry, with all the PV modules and everything going to China, there's a real risk that we, we lose that energy independence. Yeah? And so I think we need to put um, offshore wind as a strategic item um, on the political agenda. Okay, lots of uh, food for the thought there, some interesting points raised. Jonathan, maybe I'll come to you first. I mean, what's your perspective on this from the developer perspective? And obviously, you've, you've had a long career in the offshore wind industry yourself. Um, so, you know, from the Corio perspective and also from your, your own background, it would be interesting to hear how you perceive this challenge as a developer. Sure. So, I mean, I, I'm naturally and usually quite optimistic, right? And I think in this industry, you've got to be a bit of an optimist or you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning because we've always been coming up against big challenges. Um, and, and as an industry, we've always managed to rise to the challenges. And there's no question today, we have the capability, we have the capital to deliver what's needed for the energy transition. But um, I, I think at the moment, we're, we're, we're struggling because of what is maybe a bit of a self-made problem around the pricing of our product. And the, the fact is, we've probably went too far on price reduction over the, the, the years because for many years, that was an existential issue for us. We had to justify our place in the market by showing we could get the cost down so low. Um, and we've done that. In fact, we've you know, now proven we are by far the cheapest, lowest cost, most reliable way to decarbonize. Um, but right now, 
every other cost in society is starting to move upwards, and all the input costs to our industry, including really important things like cost of capital, uh, are going up. And somehow our industry is too slow to react to that because of the way in which the market's constructed, the way in which prices are set so far ahead of projects. And that's why we've got the problem in our supply chain and in developers. You know, so we, we have the capability, we have the capital to deploy, but it won't be deployed if people aren't allowed to make money <laughs> in doing it. And if we want free market industries and we want competitive processes, it has to be given a chance to be cost reflective. So I mean, if you think about what we're doing with offshore wind or any form of renewables, we, we are delivering an energy transition to decarbonise. We are delivering energy security. We are delivering an industrial revolution, an economic succession plan. We're investing in infrastructure for the long term. None of that can be achieved if all you're doing is racing to the bottom on price. So what actually has to happen mm. for everyone in the industry, especially in the supply chain, is we have to have a recognition that there's a wider value for the product that we deliver and it has to be priced accordingly. And the sooner regulators, policymakers, commentators, I think, can get on board with that, I think the sooner we can start to see the industry repair itself and start to look forward with optimism again. So how do we actually do that? I think it's, it's, it's great to be able to say that as an industry, we, we need a recognition that something has to change and, and a, a dialogue with governments about the fact that perhaps we, we need to somehow price that in. But what does that actually physically look like? What does it look like policy-wise? I mean, Katrin, you know, things like non-price um, criterion auctions, is, is that a solution? Do we need to kind of look at how we're specifically uh, tailoring policy to account for this societal value that we've just been talking about? What do you think? Yeah, that's a bit my, my hobby horse, I must say, because um, <laughs> I, I think policy can do a lot in incentivizing what is really needed at a point in time. And it's so important for governments to have in mind what is their ultimate goal? What do they want to achieve? And they can have different targets. They can say, we want to make the, the seabed, we want to get most money out of the seabed, so we want to lease it at the highest price possible. They can also say, we want to have innovation, so we give it to the one that brings the highest level of innovation. They could also say, let's give it to those that have already contracts, so that you can also support the supply chain. And I think there is actually a big danger in um, the yeah, in luring into um, negative auctions because um, they just take money out of the market. They bring it into different pockets, um, in governmental pockets, but they don't leave it in the market. And um, we've seen that now in a couple of countries. We've seen it in the UK. Um, we've also seen the latest announcement on, on Germany. I think, Matthias, you mentioned that as well. Um, the next sites will actually be bid on the basis of negative auction. And um, for me, that's a lost opportunity. Um, it will just mean that we developers, we again need to go into the, yeah, into the um, um, fight with each other. We need to bid down um, as much as possible. And that's money that is neither there for innovation, nor is it there for the supply chain. And that's for me really, mm. really a big um, trap to, that mm. we're falling into at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, do any of the other panel members want to come in on this? Yes, Mary, I can see you're uh, itching yeah, to go. Yeah, just, uh, you know, um, another layer of, of, of context to, to, to add, and, you know, and I, I agree completely with Martin and, and Jonathan's um, observations as to the, it really is a crisis that we see now across the industry. But I think, you know, it'd be quite easy to look at this crisis and, you know, the, the, the charts that Oliver had up earlier and think, well, this is, you know, an effect of the of the Russian invasion. This is an effect of you know post-COVID pandemic, etc. But really, you know, this is an impact that's been building up for many, many years, which predates um, the COVID pandemic. Absolutely predates the Russian invasion. They have just exacerbated what's already been quite a creaking industry. So therefore, I think the response really needs to be one that's not of a short-term mindset, that's really looking at the fundamentals of the, the structure of the industry of, of energy markets. And, you know, Katrina is exactly correct, you know, where there are negative pricing, where there are, um, you know, auctions for, for seabed leasing, that's all ending up in putting pressure on the supply chain or putting pressure on the cost of electricity to the consumer Absolutely. or both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ma Martin, whose problem is this to deal with then? 
Yeah, I, I, I think I agree a lot yeah, to, to what you say, that we need to have this long-term trajectory, like these quick fixes will not work. Yeah? In our views, and we just published a white paper on that, that we need to see offshore wind or the wind industry as a strategic um, element. And, and we are asking for, as an OEM, we're asking for three things. The, the first, it starts with the pipeline, right? There's an obvious lag between the ambitions and the pipeline we can see, but we need to have a transparent, dependable pipeline. Um, to fill our factories and to in do the next investments because we have, of course, a long lead time if we build factories. Yeah? That's maybe also interesting for new countries that want to come. Yeah? The more dependable it is, the easier it is the, um, to, to start. The second one is the supply chain risks. Um, I think that we need to change the way tenders and auctions are done. Negative pricing is, is not good. It takes money away, fully agree. I think we also need to, unfortunately, adapt the contracts that we have to you with um, risk clauses, yeah? so, so we will not take all the hits anymore. Um, that will not happen. Um, and the third is the investments. Yeah? We need to further invest um, to build this. And very often, wind is considered as like a, a mature you know, industry or innovation. So all the innovation money, the budgets from the governments actually go somewhere else. And I think we need to stop that, that we can also direct that into capacity, into yeah, maybe um, new turbines, technology to hydrogen, and, and so on because without that, it will be very, very difficult. Yeah? Um, and I think it's also good for the government because they get affordable energy, it's independent, yeah, makes you independent, it's um, very great to combat climate change, um, and it brings um, a local value creation. So I think that's a pretty good deal, yeah, what we offer. Absolutely, and maybe Matthias, can I just come back to you because BP, relatively new entrant into offshore wind, and how, how do you see BP's role in, in this market? I mean, you've explained some of that in the keynote speech, but it would be good to kind of tease that out a little bit more because I think you do bring a slightly different perspective perhaps to this challenge. Well, what I can say is um, we are very serious and very committed about this industry and about renewables in general. Um, I think you said the oil and gas companies are rushing into the market. I think there is a bit of a fast track process to it, but we need that kind of fast tracking all over the place, um, both in terms of permitting and in terms of development cycles and so on. So that, that per se is probably a good thing. But what I can just say uh, for BP is we will um, um, do this with the necessary financial dis discipline and in a way that is sustainable business. Um, and we were very committed <coughs> to deploying a lot of investment into this industry, um, but also um, with, with an angle to how do we deliver this? Mm. Uh, and that's actually a very important uh, question for the industry now. So do we also create frameworks which enable us to deliver? And uh, a, a lot of times we, you know, we only see that six, seven years later, five years later, so this time lap, this yeah. gap between making a decision, someone winning, and then someone really putting it into the water, and then somehow not living up to what has been promised before. I think that is something which must not happen in the future. Otherwise, we will miss our targets. I think that's such a good point. I just want to focus in on this point around the kind of time, time lag, um, and maybe come to you, Jonathan, again. I mean, we've heard a lot about the energy crisis, about the situation with Ukraine and its impact on the, the industry and society as a whole. I just want to ask you from the energy crisis perspective, because many of the governments in this room will be thinking about their, their future, their energy future. What's your perspective on how offshore wind can contribute to tackling the energy crisis, bearing in mind what we've just been discussing around kind of lead times and, and lag times? Sure. Well, the first thing is offshore wind is already making a positive contribution because every day in Europe we're seeing massive quantities of clean, green, reliable energy being delivered from offshore projects on uh, stable prices because of the long-term contracts. Mm. So there's already a contribution there. But, I mean, I think looking forward, uh, this crisis, I think, has shown just how important things like offshore wind is. You know, these crises we're talking about are horrible tales of human tragedy, so let's not make light of it. But quite often in life, when you suffer from institutional inertia, when a crisis comes, that's when you see change and you see movement. And that's probably what we're seeing now, which um, in the long term uh, is helpful. It's a crisis of two things, isn't it? It's a, it's a crisis of energy security and it's a crisis of price volatility. And I mean, I hate to be the guy that stands on the sidelines of a crisis and say, we told you so, but we told you so. 
for how many years has this industry talked about energy security and it's just been downplayed and ignored? And now it's become such a relevant topic. Um, and of course, what it means now is that we need to move as fast as we can to the deployment of renewable energy, particularly offshore renewables. I think it makes no sense to make long-term commitments to gas, short-term maybe, but the sooner we can transition away, now surely that's the right answer. And it doesn't make an awful lot of sense to talk about solutions that won't even be relevant for 15, 20 years. The, the crisis is now, and the solutions need to be the ones that can be delivered now. So that's the first thing. Second thing on price volatility, again, we told you so. We've been talking about volatility in the hydrocarbon market forever. Uh, OK, we didn't predict the situation in Ukraine, but that volatility was always going to come back at some point. So now what we need to talk about is wholesale market reform. And how long have we been talking about that in this industry, about the future of the market? And the sooner we can decouple the electricity price from renewables, from the wholesale gas markets, the better. In the UK, we're already seeing actually conversations about bringing you know, the, the kind of older projects uh, onto CFDs, which I think is starting to signal uh, an appetite for that. And I also think we can go further. I mean, even in the private PPA market, I mean, we've talked about this as Corio in, in, in other forums, that wouldn't it be a smart thing if across Europe, big industrials, heavy users of electricity were somehow mandated to buy long contracts for at least a portion of their power and those long contracts that come from renewables? Because mm. what you do is you insulate those big industrials from price shock, which stops you then having to bail them out, and you create a huge stimulus in the market for selling our product. And so you again, you move the market away from gas and you mo you, you're moving towards your objectives. Mm -hmm. So sorry, that's a bit of a technical detail point, but I just want to say that there are solutions that offshore wind can bring. Uh, and, and we really now need, I think, to take seriously what we've been talking about for years and look at ramping up deployment and wholesale market reform. Mm -hmm. And maybe coming to the rest of the panel, I mean, who's getting this right in the world at the moment is from the energy crisis response point of view. Are there any uh, governments who are kind of, you know, standing out in terms of their response? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, Does anyone want to take that one? Yeah. No, I, what, what made me think now is um, we have been cooperating with um, BASF, the chemical industry in um, Holland Sikhu South. And that's, of course, the idea behind it, that you have the customer at hand and the customer goes um, beyond um, and also integrates um, into the business by going into equity. I think that's then the furthest you can go. You can also work, of course, with um, power purchase agreements. But those kind of really matching um, a, an offtake, an industry offtake um, with um, the renewables energy makes a lot of sense. What I didn't fully understand was the decoupling of, from, from gas price um, signals because, I mean, at the moment we still have a system where in the electricity market the price discovery would include the merit order principles and then also the gas prices. And to me that's still a very healthy um, system, even if now it is blurred by the very high gas prices. But there needs, I think there needs to be a mechanism to have this price discovery. So what is a competitive price mechanism where then as offshore wind we can come in and say, yes, we are price competitive. If you go with us, you are actually better off as industry because you get um, this very reliable or generally reliable um, electricity at um, competitive prices. So I, I didn't fully understand that part, but I think this matching of um, demand side and um, the, the uh, supply directly makes a lot of sense to me. Go for it. Shall I clarify? Um, what, what, what I mean is, if you take the current market principle, right, which is the price discovery based on the short run marginal cost of the plant supplying, and you run that out 10, 15, 20 years from now, when renewable penetration is where it is, where, where is your price signal and what price is that giving you? The market is cannibalizing itself over the long term. And somehow that needs to be altered anyway. So the current market can't really be fit for purpose 15 years from now when most of the power is coming from a extremely low short run marginal cost technology like renewables. So somehow the wholesale market needs to be fixed. Why not fix it now and start centrally buying renewable power at a price for the long term that makes sense for everyone? 
And maybe kind of thinking a bit more globally, because I, I think uh, this is a very live conversation in many European markets, but thinking about non-European and emerging markets, I mean, what are the principles that really they should be adopting if they, they do want to kind of build a, an industry which, which makes sense from a market point of view in 10, 20 years' time? Does anyone want to come in on that? Me, yeah, keep, keep talking, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think the principles depend on the objectives, right? And I think in any market, you've got to ask yourself, what are the objectives that you want to get out of this? If all you want is cheap electricity, then run quantitative price-led processes to, to get the electricity to, to, to the lowest price. If what you're trying to do is decarbonise, grow an industry, gain energy security, you need to take a much more strategic long-term approach. And that means that if you're a new market, like we see a lot in Asia, there's a lot of developing new markets, you've got to allow for the fact that in the early years, there are going to be enabling projects that are laying down enabling infrastructure that's growing the industry, that's proving the technology, whatever it is, and that needs supported to a higher degree. And you want to choose companies to do that for you that can be trusted to deliver. So your processes are more qualitative an outcome led, mm -hmm. uh, whereas in the more mature markets, when you've already reached that point, you can be a bit more quantitative and a mm. bit more price oriented. Mm. So it depends on your, out, your outlook and your maturity and your objectives. Uh, what I see a lot of in Asia right now is being willing actually to take that long term view and, and, and uh, you know, work with incoming investors to structure the market in a way that is actually using the early volumes to promote the supply chain and, and, yes. and, and enable the infrastructure. And that's really healthy. And that makes me quite optimistic about some of the markets, particularly markets like Korea, where I think there's a, you know, a really healthy attitude to, to growing their industry over there. And maybe just then, do you want to come in off the back of that? I was going to ask you another question as well, which you might want to consider in your response, which was where does the balance lie on, on some of this qualitative uh, criteria? Yeah, so maybe just to, to, to take up um, that point that Jonathan was making, like that, that strategic long-term approach, I think, then has the potential to bring an enormous amount of benefits to, to a country that is you know, strategically developing an industry. You know, going back to the topic earlier of supply chain, you know, I often hear the question asked, you know, how many gigawatts does it take for, say, uh, Martin to you know to sanction opening so open a factory, a factory yes. or you know creating a facility, whereas you know I would I would encourage uh, markets that have this opportunity to to really strategically think forward and plan out over a number of years, to really think um, with a more holistic point of view when it comes to then you know supporting um, supply chain because I think there are a large number of you know very high value um, jobs that think that can be created and, and skills that can be. Um, enabled in, you know, in engineering, in marine, in consultancy, in digitalization that can then service right across the region. So, you know, in, in many of, of our markets in Vietnam, for example, we do a lot of work with local industries, mm. uh, or sorry, local universities, um, involving them in, you know, site survey work that we're doing so as to, you know, show them what is, what the, the, the jobs of the future um, are and what they entail and, and to help then shape university courses and, yeah. and, and skilling. So I think, um, Martin would always get the question as to, you know, what does it take to, to open a factory? But I think that the, that the opportunity is far more holistic than that in terms of those high value added jobs as well as, as manufacturing and the, the, the several tiers of supply chain that can be created when it comes to transitioning um, jobs from, you know, a, a nascent shipping or, or oil and gas sector or within fishing communities across portal areas, but also broader across the region. And Matthias, I see you nodding along there uh, with your, your supply chain background as well. I just wondered if you wanted to come, come in on this, this point. So I guess where does the balance lie in terms of local content uh, and acceleration of the market? <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it requires long-term planning and, uh, and, and strategic foresight. Uh, this is clear. But of course, there's a mismatch with like uh, legislation and uh, how long are people uh, in there and they need to de demonstrate short-term success. So that offshore wind is just long lead times and uh, we will always see a bit of a, a trade-off um, where, where we need to balance in between. But I think there's so much to show. Um, it's, it's sometimes very um, really about explaining the benefits 
to the communities, but also um, to, the, to politicians. Um, where do, do they lie, right? On the job, as you mentioned, first tier, second tier, third tier, people um, Im immediately jump on um, um, cell factory <laughs> or blade factory, and they want to see that in, in their respective country. But you could really build up a very smart second tier, third tier supply chain, um, and which creates a lot more jobs, direct and indirect jobs, uh, by planning accordingly. Mm -hmm. I think that is really one of the learnings uh, and then somehow I would encourage a lot of like cross-country collaboration there so we don't Absolutely. duplicate uh, efforts. Absolutely. Okay, so now it's your turn. We're going to go to some audience questions. I am going to segue over to this microphone. And if you would like to ask a question of our expert panel, please raise your hand. Please also state where you're from. If you don't raise your hand, I'm just going to start picking people. <laughs> I can't believe that there's no questions. Yes, gentleman over there. Of course, he's over there. <laughs> there you go. Please say your name and where you're from. Hi, hello. My name is Rafa Libera, Actin Group from the UK. I had a question regarding more rapid deployment at offshore wind, which Jonathan was talking about. <coughs> if Offshore wind is really um, meant to secure perception among the general public as a very secure source of supply. What are the best solutions to deploy in the years to come to ensure that adequate load balancing is in the system where we want to, uh, let's say, phase down the gas or coal fire power plants, which at the capacity market now constitute the main load balancing um, uh, technique or, or, or option? So a question, I guess, about sort of what are the complementary technologies to offshore wind and, and grid stability? Does anyone from the panel want to take this one? Yeah, I can. Yep, go, go for it, Jonathan. <laughs> okay, thank you. I thought you were gonna go in yeah. Katrine, but okay. Um, well, so th three, three things that don't require nuclear or gas, just as an example, right? How you can do this with renewables. All technologies or, or um, uh, things that are feasible today, right? One is storage, integrated storage uh, on, on the network, uh, large scale storage to, to balance. Second is interconnection, higher degree of interconnection uh, uh, amongst the offshore projects, but also between markets, uh, helping to smooth out peaks and troughs. And the third is a more sophisticated approach to demand side management, taking a lot of load away from times of the day, it doesn't need to be there and shifting it. And if you get those three things right, you can probably balance the system. Uh, you know, long term, there's you know, a, a lot to be done from a regulatory point of view and ramping up the technology, but conceptually those three things exist today. And Catherine, did you want to come in on that one as well? Yeah, I actually had the same. I had the interconnection in mind because that's really the solution across the countries, also with um, different wind patterns. And the other one is definitely the demand side. Because if you consider that you will have so many hours where there is a lot of wind in the system or production from wind assets in the system, and then you will have prices that can be very low or down to zero or even um, negative, it makes so much sense for industry or for customers to adjust to that and then benefit from it. And on the other hand, being able not to use the electricity at the point where it's high prices. So uncoupling the, the processes in industry, looking into that makes, makes so much sense. Yeah. And I think just to add, there is a lot of experience now around this very topic in Europe. You know, grids like Ireland, like Denmark, like the UK that have a very high penetration of renewables are absolutely going through this process at the moment. And certainly if there's World Bank delegates in the room who want to know more about that, very happy to make some connections with you on that specific topic. Um, any other questions from the room? This is your chance to, to ask these offshore wind leaders uh, questions that might be of concern to you. Quiet audience, yes. Thank you, that was, uh, that was a wonderful panel, a lot of good information. Um, just wanted, Jonathan, you mentioned, Matthias, you also talked about it. Um, what can we take away from previous renewable industries that we could apply to the offshore wind in ensuring a steady market 
right? I mean, one of the things you talked about um, is thinking about qualitative attributes right now, whether it's a procurement target, and then slowly moving into the quantitative aspects. I just wanted to get in and know if we had the solar, we had onshore wind, and now we're moving into offshore wind. What lessons can we take from them in ensuring that we have a steady path for acceleration? Maybe Matthias, do you want to go first and then Jonathan? Yeah, I think um, clearly um, we, we also really um, endorse um, bits where it's not just quantitative, but where you can demonstrate um, some of the capabilities you have as a company in order to offer the customer a more holistic uh, solution. Um, so the bits in, in the Netherlands, I, I mean, no matter who wins, but it is like a, a really a, a level playing field for showing these capabilities and, and leverage certain things in which also benefit um, um, the, the wider ecosystem. Um, so then uh, I think there's some element of um, pre-qualification or showing that people are really able to deliver on the long run and uh, really that you get the right, right ones in really um, full, helping you fulfill your targets. And uh, I think getting into this uh, sp spiral of negative bidding, that's also not very good. And in, in, in certain markets, uh, which are pretty nascent, already being exposed to merchant risk is probably something which, which will ch challenge a, a lot of us. So it's also important to have some kind of very um, transparent, clear route to market, which at least can enable us to, to plan ahead. So that's the three key points I would mention now um, in, a, in, in that context, but uh, please. Thank you. Uh, firstly, uh, it's good to see someone from the United States here, because that shows us that offshore wind is going to do something that the Beatles didn't do, and that's <laughs> become very big in America. So there we go. So that's great. But So I, I'm going to add to what you, what you said, Matthias. I agree with all of that. But what, one thing I think we should learn, um, because in almost every market, grid eventually became the bottleneck. And it's because we were taking baby steps incrementally, never quite sure how big renewables was going to be, obsessed about stranding of grid infrastructure. And now we see renewables being you know, the, the backbone of the power system. I think it's now to, time to learn from that and actually kind of go along on the grid infrastructure. You, you, you know the film, The Field of Dreams? If you build it, they will come. That's the mentality we need. We need to build the grid ahead of time, allow operators to, to make those anticipatory investments. Otherwise, in every market, grid will be the bottleneck for an offshore wind program. Yeah. And it always takes longer to build a grid than you think. Yeah. <laughs> and we had this, in Germany, we had these virtual offshore wind parks, the ones that were standing there with no grid connection but had to be compensated. That's no good. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And, I, you know, I, sorry, go on there. Just yeah. another couple of, of comments, um, Rebecca. You know, I think we have we have seen you know collectively across so many markets um, a stop-start approach and the, the the kind of nascent steps and then a pause and and that just you know clearly uh, slows down the levels of investment that can be made. You know, slows down success, slows down you know planning, say for investment in in grid infrastructure and the like. And the other, just the other comment I would make is that, you know, I would encourage more seabed to be opened up because, you know, as a seabed is, is effectively rationed, it drives, you know, higher auction prices and it, you know, then you have to wait for the next tender to come up and it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I would encourage, I would encourage more, more, you know, more seabed to be opened up in a more, in a more rapid fashion, which will enable investment, which will then give, um, the signals towards the level of investment that is required then for, for grid infrastructure. You know, if you look at, at Scotland, just awarded 27 gigawatts, I think, in the, in the final tally, you know, that requires a very significant level of grid investment that's, that's not there today. And, but yet, you know, the appetite right across, you know, a very large um, pool of, of developers is to invest in that development cycle, knowing that, again, you know, it's creating the next wave of an industry. I mean, my closing question to the panel was actually going to be what one key lesson would you give to an emerging offshore wind market? And you've started to answer it yourself. So maybe I'll just go to Katrin and to Martin and then we'll, we'll close it out. So you can have more than one because the rest of the panelists did have more than one lesson. But if you want to focus on a, a key topic that you think that emerging offshore wind markets should really focus in on. First, Katrin and then Martin. Um, yeah, as we have touched upon the grid, I would take the next one coming back to what I said in the start. 
I think it's very important for the governments to think about what is their most important target and then have a relatively simple um, auctioning system that you can also pull through, through over several years. That makes it a lot easier for um, developers to go through and um, it also is not too much sunk cost because if you have all little pieces in a tender and um, the developers need to put a lot of effort into it, um, yeah, it's, that's not efficient. So I would really recommend having nailed uh, what, what is it you want to get out from as a, as a government. And the same question yeah. to you, Martin. Yeah, I would definitely say go for it. Offshore is great. <laughs> and we talk a lot about energy crisis. Actually, the climate crisis is much worse, you know, and it will hit a lot of us. And I think offshore, we brought it to a maturity, a scale that is great. I think you can learn some, some countries. I really like the Netherlands. We always call it a clockwork because they have figured it out also with the, with the grid, how they have a strategy. I like Taiwan because they've been really bold and fast. I like the UK because they have a good CFD model and these rounds. So I think you can pick and choose. If it comes to local content and manufacturing, I think there are a lot of jobs actually in the service, in the deployment. Yeah. I would not go there first because for us as an OEM, it will be always an obstacle. We look at the market, the pipeline, and it will add cost to it in, in a very early phase, which maybe you don't want. If the market is large, you know, logistics and so on speak probably a different language, that's a different question, yeah? but that would be my advice. Great. Well, thank you so much to the panel here. If you can give them, uh, show them your thanks, that'd be fantastic. And that's all we've got time for today. But thank you so much for listening. And um, if you do have further questions, I'm sure um, I, I'm happy to take them. The GWAC team's happy to take them. I'm sure you can try and catch some of our, our panel as they wing their way to, to other things. But, but thank you very much. And uh, close out this session. Thanks. <laughs>